to you so that you would be aware of that and so that you'd have an opportunity to hear from the parties. Um, with respect to the, the claims that are, would be released, I do think it is important, the, the distinctions that were just drawn out by the county um, in the sense that the prior county settlement agreement included a contribution bar. Um, as I went back and heard the testimony today, I reread the San Gabriel Valley Water Company on behalf of Fontana Water Company. Uh, their comments and the language that they were seeking. And um, I'll, I'll profess there was, a, for me at least, a little bit of a disconnect, something I'm happy to talk to them about um, in the future, that their real concern is that somehow any administrative settlement agreement would be used as a contribution bar, but the settlement agreement by its express terms disavows that it could be used as a settlement or as a contribution bar under CERCLA. Um, and beyond that, I mean, the greater contribution bar concerns that, that frankly, I would like to explore with them would be the fact that the consent decree that US EPA would be pursuing would provide that contribution bar. So, you know, based on what's in the settlement agreement um, and the way that their letter was couched, it seems like their claims would be preserved. Now, you get to an important issue, Ms. Bobby Weber, which is what this settlement agreement would prevent is an opportunity if down the road, um, the regional board or the state board, you know, the regional board has already executed this agreement, but the whole agreement, as I understand it, does not become effective until the state board signs as well. Um, if Fontana Water Company wanted the regional board to assert claims under Porter Cologne against any of these potentially responsible parties for releases from the specific site that's within the settlement agreement, the regional board would be barred by the settlement agreement from doing that. To the extent that any of these claims actually impacted Fontana and it wanted to pursue them, based on the absence of a contribution bar, um, Fontana would be able to pursue them. Um, and just sort of my final observation, and again, I have not been involved um, in any way, shape, or form with the actual discussions between US EPA and the various work parties and the settling parties. But um, Fontana Water District has described uh, these settlements as not addressing any of their concerns. However, to the extent that they are concerned that it is pollution emanating from the site in Rialto, these settlement agreements effectuate a cleanup of that site and it will reduce the mass concentration and otherwise of perchlorate TCE and other contaminants that could in the future impact Fontana Water Company's wells. Any other questions? Uh, but help me understand this a little bit. I, I, if and it, maybe I should have asked everybody who came up and spoke about it. So Fontana saying that they're being iced out of something. There seems to be a, a distinction saying that their wells aren't affected by this particular site. So the question I have is: Are there other PRPs outside of these settling PRPs in another location? Because perchlorate use is all contaminations all over the place that they want us or the regional board to be pursuing I that's think, sort uh, of what i heard from people was this site the discussion was whether this site was actually impacting them and what you're saying is if i'm sorry i used it as a verb i, I apologize if um uh the cleanup in any event would solve the problem if it is coming from this site is what you're just saying so the remedy that the regional board, I'll let Kurt <laughs> answer this and help everybody listening understand, um, this, take, this would be the remedy that people would have for this, the contamination from this site, regardless of who was being affected. And you have the government entities closest to it, regional board, EPA, et cetera, have been looking at it, saying this is the remedy that will clean up the contamination from this site. But I heard implicit in what one of the earlier parties was saying that the contamination of Fontana's wells may be coming from something else. And my question is, what's, what are we doing with the something else, I guess? Yeah, I think Mr. Birchtold would be in the best position to answer that. I, the only thing that I would just say as an observation is I, you characterized it as uh, Fontana being iced out. Um, again, the administrative settlement agreements that in form that have been presented to us, which is at this point just the PSI settlement, you know, doesn't ice out their claims per se. It's, um, and I wouldn't want to go into how the parties got to the language they got to, but it, it, it's clear that it preserves other person's claims and doesn't prevent them from pursuing them. 
Right, but uh, what I heard um, Fontana say is not necessarily just their claims, but what they want us to do. Right, and that was that the, was their concern. And I'm I'm just trying to understand that, and and Kurt can help explain this, which is. It, it sounds like this would be what Kurt would do whether they were in or out because they're trying to come up with a remedy that's going to resolve it, but that Kurt and Mr. Proskins. Um, yeah, let me Just help see, me understand. Yeah, let me see what I can do to help here. Um, Mr. Fudas, Fudas talked about the uh, hydrologic study and the isotope study that are, that are ongoing. Um, the, the hydrologic study is largely complete, but the results have not been published. The uh, isotope study is ongoing, but some data has been produced from that study thus far. And there's other evidence that's been produced over the last 10 years related to Fontana's wells as well. But the information that's available to us at present indicates that Fontana's wells are not affected by these settling parties in the Rialto Colton Basin. There's some evidence to indicate that, um, in particular for Fontana's wells that are located in the Chino Basin, which th they didn't really mention that, but many of their affected wells are actually located in the Chino Basin, a different basin than the Rialto Colton Basin. We believe that the most likely sources uh, for the perchlorite in those Chino Basin wells is a combination of Chilean nitrate fertilizer used in that area in the past with the possibility of some naturally occurring perchlorate present in those wells as well. Um, so we have not identified any PRPs that we would be able to pursue for those wells, but it's clear to us at present at least that these wells are not affected by any of the settling parties. But, but you did just say that, I mean, you haven't seen the hydrology report yet. We've, we've, we've heard about the findings of the hydrology report, yes. Oh. It's not been published, but uh, it, there have been meetings where USGS has reported on their findings. Okay, and they, they do not seem to have a sm the smoking gun that... Certainly, certainly no smoking gun. The, the, the focus of the hydrologic study has to do with the fault that creates at least right. a partial barrier between the, the Rialto Colton Basin and the Chino Basin. And as Mr. Fudas noted, it's not a, a, a perfect barrier, but it does impede groundwater flow, uh, particularly in the northern part of these basins where these sources are located. Um, there's other evidence to indicate that perchlorate is not moving in the direction of the fault from the sources in the Rialto Colton Basin. And there's ample information about uh, heavy use of Chilean nitrate fertilizer in the Chino Basin in the past. Now and there's, there's also there's some of the isotope results that have been produced, and the isotope results clearly indicate that Chilean nitrate fertilizer is present in a number of the wells outside of what we recognize as the perimeter of, of these plumes. So it's clear that, based on the, the isotope data that's been provided to date, that there is Chilean nitrate fertilizer that's affecting a number of the wells in this general area. Is there anything that the regional board can do to work with Fontana on their particular problem, whether it's completely separate from, from this other issue? If, 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 if the, well, I mean, they've got a problem, no doubt about it. So. Um, what, well, can the, what can the regional board do? Yeah, we, we've not identified any, any PRPs that we would be able to pursue with respect to those issues. The, the state board has provided cleanup and abatement account funds in the past, some of which have been provided to Fontana to support wellhead treatment systems. Uh, and they've also, you know, they've participated in projects funded by the U.S. government to um, um, support future wellhead treatment projects as well. I guess it just it just seems to me that if if you and, and you know just let me one other okay. point, <laughs> Fontana is not in a unique position in the Santa Ana region. There are virtually every water supply agency in the Santa Ana region that relies on groundwater has at least one well that's affected by perchlorate, and a number of those agencies have, at their own expense, based on a recognition that 
that perchlorate was coming from past fertilizer use, they funded wellhead treatment systems because they needed to do that in order to meet their water supply needs. Um, there is a widespread perchlorate problem in the Santa Ana region, most of which is not coming from industrial point sources. Um, and it's just something that, that many water supply agencies in our region have had to, unfortunately, bite the bullet and deal with. So would you invite them to come in and talk with you about what their, what their options are? We're, we're happy to, to meet with them. Uh, we participate in the perchlorate task force that Fontana is a member of, and, and we have ongoing meetings and discussions with them. Um, obviously, we'll be, we will be following the ongoing results of the isotope study to see if that produces any new information that gives us any better understanding. Thank you, Kurt. Okay, folks, what's your pleasure? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Karen O'Hare, bef before you act on this, we have one proposed amendment to the resolution, if somebody's going to make a motion on it, and that would be on number 11, should be amended to include the city of Colton, comma, after the phrase, the Santa Ana Water Board. Oh, that was Chris's. I move for adoption of the item with the amendment just read into the record by Ms. O'Hare. I'll hey. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Mr. Howard, would you uh, introduce item number 11, please? Mr. Lawfer, if the estimates of time are anywhere near correct on item number 11, should we dismiss the folks for 7, 8, and 9, or how do you want to do that? Or do you want to buy pizza? Um, I think most of the folks for 7, 8, and 9 um, may have taken a little breather outside anyway, but um, I would expect that at the very earliest, uh, probably 4 o'clock before we pick up with those items. This calls for, in my math, four hours. Okay, that number may be a little bit larger than the number I'm thinking. But. Okay. Item number 11, consideration of an order regarding petitions. Uh, of the SAC Regional County Sanitation District and uh, California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance for waste discharge requirements issued to City of Sacramento or Sacramento Regional Treatment Plant. Excuse me, sorry. Um, I'm here to speak on item eight. Uh, are you dismissing everything for the rest of the day? Or? Sorry, we're, um, item seven, eight, and nine, uh, at the pleasure of the chair, were moved until after the SAC Regional item. So okay. our best guess we're is hoping probably we're an hour and a half. Okay, I'm sorry, we couldn't hear back today. All yours, James. Yes. Good afternoon, board, uh, board chair and members of the board. My name is James Herrick with the Office of Chief Counsel. Um, to give you a little background, the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District owns and operates the SAC Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant. The facility serves approximately 1.3 million people with an average dry weather flow of 141 million gallons per day and an authorized maximum of 181. It currently provides secondary treatment and the discharge, the outfall diffuser, is just downstream of the Freeport Bridge within the Delta. As you may recall, we had a workshop back in July of 2010, or 2012 uh, where we discussed the permit and a uh, proposed order. We received I'm sorry. Can you just get a soft? little closer to it? Sorry. Yeah, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, where we discussed uh, the proposed order and uh, the comment, many comments were received in reaction to that, and you saw a lot of people speak here. Um, in reaction to the July 18th workshop, uh, we the staff work, went back and revised the uh, draft order. That order was distributed to the public on October 29th of this year. The revised uh, draft order. Uh, made some changes to the pathogens and to the nitrate section and primarily. Regarding pathogens, uh, we did not pr uh, propose any changes to our ultimate conclusion. There was some reorganization and mainly some additions uh, that were requested by the Central Valley Water Board and the water agencies. Uh, regarding the 13241 section, um, in response to the district's comment of the Rec 1 criteria contained within the basin plan, it was rewritten 
to identify the, the, that particular Rec 1 objective um, and to note that the Regional Board did make findings and these are based on evidence within the administrative record. Regarding ammonia, um, there were very minor non-substantive edits to the bulk of the ammonia discussion regarding the denial of dilution credits and mixing zone. Um, however, the final affluent limitation was recalculated. Um, staff did this because the proposed order, as we will discuss in a minute, uh, did, does not recommend a remand for reconsideration of the nitrate limit. Um, so we went ahead and just revised the calculation. Staff used the same methods that the regional board used when it developed the permit as also the same method that was utilized, that was directed by this board to regional board uh, in order WQ 2009-3, City of Tracy. <coughs> The recalculation resulted in an average monthly affluent limit of 1.5 milligrams per liter and a max daily affluent limit of 2.0 milligrams per liter. Additionally, because temperature is a significant, significant variable in this calculation, staff recommends an allowance of a less stringent limit during the colder months uh, when the receiving water temperature is significantly cooler, uh, November through March. This allows a winter affluent limitation of 2.4 average monthly and 3.3 milligrams per liter max daily. The allowance of this uh, less stringent affluent limitation during the winter uh, does not result in any reduced protection of the receiving water quality. Regarding nitrates or nutrients, uh, the permit does uh, maintains that the primary MCL that the regional board used for the protection of the MUN beneficial use, um, but denies the mixing zone, denies the dilution credits and mixing zones because of downstream aquatic uh, ecosystem effects, is incorrect. Staff retains this position. Um, but recognizes that nitrification without denitrification would continue the nutrient loading from a large controllable point source and the discharge would continue to be harmful to the Bay Delta ecosystem. At the request of the regional board and the water agency, staff re-examined their concerns regarding total nutrient loading. The revised draft order upholds the 10 milligram per liter as an interim effluent limitation. This will necessitate the implementation of denitrification as the district upgrades its facility as a result of the permit. The limit is a significant step in protecting the Bay Delta ecosystem from cultural eutrophication. Implementation of the existing narrative, <clears throat> this will implement the existing narrative biostimulatory substances objectives in both the regional uh, Central Valley Water Board and San Francisco Bay Water Board's basin plans. The revised draft order cites to a number of reasons set forth in the administrative record for the need to control the district's discharge of nutrients. Uh, including but not uh, the Bay Delta, the, the fact that the Bay Delta is nutrient enriched and does, uh, does not follow the typical paradigm influenced by turbidity, invasive clam grazing, and the decrease of freshwater flows. Um, that the Sassoon Marsh is impaired for nutrients and Sassoon Bay is essential habitat for endangered species and their food supply is being affected by these excessive nutrients. Additionally, evidence of cyanobacteria blooms in the Delta as an indicator uh, of uh, excessive nutrients and evidence of other harmful alg algal blooms in San Francisco Bay, evidence of taste and odor impacts on drinking water supplies, clogging of drains and pumps, and as a result of uh, uh, treatment of for drinking water, uh, the formation of carcinogenic byproducts. The protection of uh, downstream estuary uh, systems from upstream point sources of nutrients is a widespread issue. Briefly discussed in the order is the Upper Blackstone Water Pollution Abatement District, the US EPA decision. It was a recent First Circuit uh, decision out of Boston upheld by US EPA, included in an NPDES permit for POTW containing five milligrams per liter, total N, limited due to cultural eutrophication concerns. We do note that the US EPA in that particular instance used existing state criteria from Rhode Island. Additionally, staff uh, looked at the Los Coyotes and Tosco orders in the, uh, for upholding an interim effluent limitation for nitrate, um, that this board has done that before. Uh, in the order, we discussed Los Coyotes, it, Los Coyotes, which was Water Quality Order 2003-12, where this board upheld an interim performance-based effluent limitation of 10 milligrams per liter of inor inorganic nitrogen because of the exceedance of the downstream biostimulatory objectives. Also, although not discussed in this order, this board has also upheld interim limits uh, in the Tosco order uh, for while uh, TMDL was pending in that particular situation. Consistent with Tosco, a final water quality based effluent limit will be calculated based on the evolving science. The interim restrictions on the district's discharge are necessary to fill the gap until a finer, final water quality based effluent limit can be derived. 
The order concludes that section by uh, noting that the regional board could have used a uh, adopted a final water quality based effluent limit using the existing US EPA 304A criteria, also called the Eco Region 1 criteria. And currently notes that the state board is working on a statewide method for control of nutrients, uh, more commonly referred to as the NNE or the nu nu nutrient numeric endpoints. We received seven comment letters uh, in response to the draft order. Three that were in support were the Central Valley Water Board, US EPA Region 9, and the water agencies. The water agencies and the regional board made a uh, request to augment the draft order language or to add various sources from the administrative record into existing footnotes. Most of these staff do not recommend accepting, either because staff do not re uh, concur with the language change or uh, the changes were to, were to parts of the order that were not changes from the May version. Uh, and the hearing notice in this particular instance did limit comments to changes only between the two orders. We had four uh, commenters that were opposed to the draft order, Bakwa, Casa Tritech, Saviqwa, and the district. Bakwa was generally concerned about our nutrient approach and also concerned about footnotes 100 and 129 that recommended that in addition to the Central Valley Water Board, that the region, uh, San Francisco Water Board should consider future regulatory efforts to limit nutrient loading from major point sources to the Bay Delta ecosystem. The other three commenters, uh, took issue primarily with the pathogens, 13241 section, the ammonia recalculation, and the nutrient sections. Regarding pathogens, many of the arguments are similar to those that were discussed at the July workshop. Staff disagree, as set forth in the revised order, a site-specific risk assessment was completed for this major controllable point source to minimize pathogens from primarily human sources. The district's own modeling study does show that within as little as 300 feet downstream of the point of discharge, the warm effluent does rise and uh, quickly within the river, such that a 15 to 1 dilution may be found near the surface of the river. Uh, regarding the ammonia calculation, uh, there is an argument from the district that we should use an alternate calculation method that was used in other regional uh, Central Valley Water Board permits. Uh, again, I, uh, we reiterate that staff use the same method that the regional board used in development of this permit, uh, and it is a method that was directed by this board down to the Central Valley Water Board uh, in the Tracy order. Regarding nutrients, um, the, there are many, uh, many arguments that I'm sure the district and others will be commenting on. Um, of note, we'd like to uh, state that uh, in this particular instance, we think that the order goes into great depth as to why we believe that there is reasonable potential that the district is contributing to an exceedance of the biostimulatory objectives. While we did not use the SIP or the TSD methodologies, neither of those is binding in this situation, nitrate not being a priority pollutant. As detailed in the order, the science is evolving, and in this context, the existing RPA methods are not appropriate in this context. This is a complex ecosystem, and it was appropriate, it's appropriate to address these concerns now, rather than late, late, waiting till later as the ecosystem continues to decline. There are also many arguments that we either ignored evidence, or relied on other evidence that the regional board did not rely on, or is contrary, quote, to prevailing scientific opinion. While it is correct that we did not rely on the exact same evidence that the regional board relied on, uh, as, I've ex as explained in the draft order, we are taking a different approach and looking at this as a biostimulatory objective exceedance. Um, this is also stated in the draft order as a different rationale, because we're upholding this as an interim affluent limitation. There is a change sheet. Uh, we did stick a few copies in the back. It was circulated last night. Uh, and it's, uh, most of these are non-substantive substantive changes. Um, several of the changes are clarifying that this nitrate limit is an interim limit. Um, there were also some additional footnotes added for citations, uh, a, correction, a corrected citation to footnote 36, and the acceptance of a couple of water uh, agency changes. Um, however, we do have a couple additional changes that we missed. Um, if on the change sheet, on page 32 in the sentence, so the, and all of these are very non-substantive, non on the sentence cited, cited by James, Philip, James, slow down. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. On page 32 of the change sheet, it's the sentence about, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six lines from the bottom that starts with the discharge is crossed out. This says the increase. 
reverse that. I got that backwards. It should be the discharge of ammonium nitrogen, not the increase. And then two lines down, the bold capital the in front of zooplankton should be removed. Okay, and then one, ad I'm sorry? Sure. The last one is the bold capital the in front of zooplankton, right above footnote 108, should be removed. And then also a minor typo on the very bottom uh, of, let's see, it would be page 40 of the change sheet. First sentence of the last paragraph, the Center Valley Ward met its, I was a little dyslexic, NPDES, as opposed to NDPES. Again, no. nothing major. And then that generally concludes my presentation. I will just introduce uh, staff that are up here with me. Uh, technical staff from the far left is Russell Norman. He was our NTPDS unit staff, worked primarily on the pathogen section. Rick Rasmussen, DWQ, uh, acting as assistant deputy director. Dominic Gregorio in our Watershed Ocean Wetlands Unit, uh, and Johanna Weston with our, our Sea Fellow Grant in the Oceans Unit. Uh, they both worked on the nutri nutrients issue. And Renan Haregi uh, with the NPDS Unit staff who worked on the ammonia recalculation. And that concludes our presentation, if you have any questions. With that, Ms. Creedon, would you like to come up? Good afternoon. My name is Pamela Creedon, Executive Officer of the Central Valley Water Board, and I'm just here to thank the board and your staff for the changes to the order. Um, my staff and I, and on behalf of my board, we are supportive of your uh, changes and hope that you will adopt the order as proposed by staff. Thank you. Mr. Simmons. Actually, Paul and I are going to try to do a tag team here with the time we've got. Um, so I'm not Paul Simmons. I'm Stan Dean, District Engineer uh, for the Regional County Sanitation District. Um, and I do want to thank you for giving us the time to speak today. Um, our comments, as you've probably seen in our letter, are quite extensive on the draft order. And we're not going to get into everything today by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'm going to start off with a few introductory rem remarks. Paul is going to take over. And then I'm going to bring up some other items that I think are extremely important uh, to wrap up uh, our presentation today. Getting right to the point, the district believes uh, that the board should not adopt the order. Um, we don't believe that it affects the it, it includes the rigor of analysis that should be done in an order of this importance. Literally, we're asking you to apply the Clean Water Act and Porter Cologne as they have been written and as you have done in the past. These laws were enacted to make sure that there is a logical basis for regulation. And um, we're asking you to consider all of the evidence in the record, not the selective evidence. Um, take a broad look at it. Take an open mind as we go through our comments today. I will say that from my perspective, the aura around this permit has really been, we know what we want SAC Regional to do. Now we have to invent some way to get there. Regrettably, this draft order is an argument for an outcome rather than a careful effort to objectively evaluate the issues that we need to deal with. My job includes going before the district board to ask for rate increases. When those rate increases are justified, I do so willingly, and I have in the past. I made it very clear that we do believe that some ammonia removal is the right thing to do. But this permit goes far beyond doing just that, and we don't think it's justified. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Mr. Chairman and board members, I am uh, Paul Simmons, special counsel for the district. Thank you for your time today. I will cover just a, a few of the regulatory issues that Mr. Dean mentioned. Uh, and I want to say that our um, presentation today is going to be very focused on the tertiary filtration and disinfection. Um, however, I do want to say a little bit about the nitrate, particularly in light of the change last night, or I, I do want to make mention of the change that was proposed last night. 
This is, of course, the 10 milligram per liter uh, effluent limitation equal to the drinking water standard, which would now be upheld uh, in this proposed order. I'm talking about the regulatory side, not the technical side. We've covered the technical side in our comments. But on the regulatory side, I just want to emphasize a simple point. The discussion of nitrate effluent limits in this revised draft order does not use, address, or deal with the regulatory requirements that apply to the setting of effluent limitations, including water quality based effluent limitations based on narratives. I don't have another way to say it. The, the order doesn't acknowledge these regulatory requirements, which are laws in this section, let alone require adherence to or compliance with those requirements. It's that simple. This is covered in our comments, including on pages 40 to 43, uh, 47 to 50. We just don't see how the state board can let that happen. Now, um, we did get a change yesterday evening <coughs> which proposed that the nitrate limits be called interim. And I'm not sure what to make of that. That doesn't cure the deficiencies. Uh, the same concerns that we've expressed in our comments are still applicable. This is a little strange as an interim limit because there's now, it would say that there's no final limit. And traditionally in the NPDES permitting, it's most typical if you, you adopt a water quality based effluent limit as under the SIP, you adopt a water qual quality based effluent limit that a facility can't meet, you give them a performance based interim limit that would be in effect until the new effluent limit, final limit, kicks in. That's not what we have here. And this uh, limitation is also not a performance-based limitation as interim limits tend to be. It's not performance-based as it relates to nitrogen or to nitrate for that matter. If you have to build something to comply, it's not a performance-based effluent limit. <coughs> The remainder of our time will focus on tertiary filtration and disinfection. We have very strong objections to this section of the draft order, which we believe is argumentative, not objective, undocumented, and in many cases just plain not right. With respect to the regulatory side, the revised draft order for the first time acknowledges that indeed there's an adopted water quality objective for pathogens that applies to the Sacramento River, fecal coliform water quality objective. <coughs> and it says, it looks at a data set, and it seems to say, aha, look, the water quality objective for pathogens, the adopted objective, is not met upstream of your discharge. And thus there's no assimilative capacity with respect to that water quality objective. But downstream of the discharge, that water quality objective under the same da data set is met because the effluent is so low in fecal coliform. The effluent at end of pipe is roughly the concentration two orders of magnitude lower than the adopted water quality objective that applies to the river. The effluent is roughly two orders of magnitude lower than the upstream ambient water quality. That's not dealt with in this revised draft order. Without dealing with this data, the revised draft order does at least acknowledge that this effluent limitation is more stringent than necessary to implement any adopted water quality objective. And we agree. Unfortunately, that has led to a proposal that the board turn its back on the Porter Cologne Act. And we don't believe that you should do that. We would hope that the board believes Porter Cologne is meaningful. We believe this order would make it meaningless. And this is why. When a regional board or state board adopts a water quality, adopts a permit 
that is more stringent than necessary to implement an adopted water quality objective or when it proposes to do so, it must consider a variety of things. It must consider what water quality objectives are reasonably required to protect the beneficial use. What water quality conditions can be achieved by the coordinated control of all factors that affect water quality. Uh, e economics, the need for housing, and, and these various things, and we're talking about water code section 13263 and 13241. This board has in the past confirmed that there must be findings in a permit that reflect all of this consideration, and of course these findings have to be based on evidence in the record, and they have to connect the dots. How did you get from point A to point B? In past orders, you have examined whether this actually occurred in, in specific permits. The proposed order would throw all that out the window and Porter Cologne with it. What it would say is, we the board have changed our mind. We think that there exists evidence about each of these factors somewhere in the record, this monstrous record, and that's good enough. That's all you have to do. It just has to be there. There's no accountability for it. This is an affront to Porter Cologne and to the board's past decisions. The regional board did ultimately make some brief findings as described in the order. Um, we believe those were something of an afterthought and an 11th hour thing. We have gone to some length to try to demonstrate to the board why we believe that those findings are not responsive to what Porter Cologne says must occur, why they're not supported by evidence, or in some cases, why they are contrary to all of the evidence in the record that we know about. The proposal in the revised draft order is that the state board not even address that issue. This newly proposed presidential order would announce that Porter Cologne is a minor nuisance and a box that has to be checked and not a cornerstone of water quality regulation in California. For that and other reasons, the order should not be adopted. Thank you, Paul. Okay, back to, back to Stan. Um, I, I believe I do have a unique perspective on all of this. Um, on the one hand, I have to implement the direction of our regional sanitation district board. On the other hand, um, I am an engineer, and I spent 10 years managing this wastewater treatment plant. And when I look at the technical arguments around the plant and what it can and can't do, um, I have to think that they are, for lack of a better term, absurd in many cases. I'm going to spend the rest of my time here talking about five trains of thought that are used to justify filtration. First one Paul already started to introduce was the adopted uh, basin plan objective of fecal coliform of 200. The order says that the objective is not met upstream. Background doesn't meet this. Downstream, it does meet it. End of pipe, we meet it by far, this objective. It seems like we ought to be getting some sort of credit in this case for because our effluent in terms of the fecal coliform is better than the river. Second train of thought. The revised draft order takes, goes out of its way to dismiss EPA recreational water quality criteria. One reason that is cited to dismiss it is that the origin of these pathogens renders them more hazardous to human swimmers. This is nonsense because the EPA criteria include numeric values for enterococcus, which are bacteria of human fecal origin. Another reason cited is that it is questioned whether these old EPA criteria are acceptable today. This is also nonsense. The EPA reissued these regulations in substantially similar form seven days ago. The EPA criteria are relevant. We more than meet them end of pipe. Again, in terms of these criteria, upstream it does not meet them, but end of pipe we meet them by far. 
We realize that the water boards have not paid much attention to the basin plan water quality objective or the EPA criteria. And it is more common to use the 20 to 1 Department of Public Health uh, dilution ratio guidance. And so this guidance is the basis for the third train of logic. To begin this train, we must recognize that in the river we have 51 to 50 to 1 dilution normally. And on all days, on a daily average, we exceed 20 to 1. And the DPH guidelines, if you look at how they are written, it says that they are 20 to 1 on an average daily basis, even in tidal conditions. That's what their guidelines say. However, the order reflects an intense search for some circumstance at some location in the water column where at some time, even for a few moments, there can be less than 20 to 1. The district has gone to great lengths to understand the river dynamics. We acknowledge that there can be less than 20 to 1 for brief periods of time. But remember, the diffuser is the bottom of the river where short-term variations are more likely to occur. Much of what the order says about the river is, and is just not true. For example, the order tries to label a situation double dosing and then go out and say that this means there's a doubling of concentrations in the river and a doubling of risks. As shown in our written comments, this is just not factually correct. If we actually consider the basin plan water quality objective and the EPA criteria, the whole argument about exact amounts of dilution here and there and there and there is pointless because in terms of these criteria, it's safer to swim in our effluent than it is in the river. On to the fourth train of thought. The order speculates that perhaps the district's chlorine disinfection system isn't very good. I'm concerned because this is not rational. Our disinfection system works well. The order asserts that particle shielding occurs at this plant, but this particle shielding is not an issue. Particle shielding does not stop disinfection from happening. It simply means that greater disinfection effort is required. As a result, we apply more chlorine and we meet our limits. Second, particle shielding is does happen in pure oxygen activated sludge plants. But we have acknowledged that we are going to need to improve, improve our secondary process to deal with the ammonia issue. Once we do that, we're no longer a pure oxygen plant and this whole issue becomes obsolete. Third, it's improper for our permit to be based on the internal workings of our plant. Rather, the permit must be concerned with what we put out and what we discharge to the river. How we meet that quality is really our responsibility. And here's the bottom line. We meet our pathogen limits end of pipe today. On to the fifth train of thought. This involves a new threshold or what might be termed an underground water quality objective in which we would not be allowed to cause an increased risk of gastrointestinal illness of 1 in 10,000 due to Giardia or Cryptosporidium. The discussion around this topic has centered on a quantitative risk assessment that was performed by Dr. Charles Gerba. When taken in proper context, this shows that the district does not exceed the 1 in 10,000 risk. Dr. Gerba's testimony clearly explains this point. The district does not change background Giardia risk, and it has a very minor effect on Cryptosporidium risk. The permit and the draft order go out of their way to find a different conclusion. They continually refer to Gerba's February 21, 2010 report that was based on abnormally conservative assumptions. And just one of those consumptions is that he said, for, just for grins basically, Let's say we go for 10 swimming events per day and run the risk analysis. Normal risk analysis would be based on one. So he just rolled it up a factor of 10 just to, just to see what it would do. After this report was written, then DPH came out and said, oh, we think this one in 10,000 is what you should meet. And said, we barely miss it, even under those extremely conservative assumptions. We were surprised by this. And after this surprise, our reaction was, wow, we didn't know you were going to bring a new standard into play. 
if that's what we're talking about, let's go back and do the risk analysis in a more conventional manner, which we did. Dr. Gerber presented a more realistic risk analysis in writing to the regional board, at the, in writing, in the testimony at the permit hearing, and to this board last summer. At each step, the real and valid evidence was ignored and dismissed. I've discussed five trains of thought, and each of them has very serious flaws, but I want to remind you of a few key facts that I've gone over. There is an established and applicable water quality objective in the basin plan and valid EPA criteria. These objectives and criteria may not be met upstream of us, but they are met end of pipe. And the diffuser is at the bottom of a very large river with lots of dilution. And while we believe the risk threshold of 1 in 10,000 is not an appropriate way to do rulemaking or write this permit, under any circumstances, we meet it. And we do not, we do not affect the overall risk to anything more than extremely negligible. There is no cause for this region to spend huge amounts of money on a problem that simply doesn't exist. In closing, we are deeply disappointed with the order. We believe the board should find it unacceptable too. The district does want to remain proactive in the watershed and a partner in the solutions for water quality. And we take our responsibilities seriously. But this order just is not the right thing to do for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Bill Jennings. Good afternoon, Chair Hoppin, board members, Bill Jennings, representing the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance. <clears throat> um, here we are as from, from 40 years following adoption of the Clean Water Act and 44 years following legislative adoption of the present iteration of Porter Cologne and virtually every significant waterway in the Central Valley is, is identified as impaired, capable of supporting identified beneficial uses. Now this permit addresses a major municipal discharge to a narrow reach of a river within a tidal, tidal prism that is identified as impaired by multiple pollutants, including toxicity, and home to sensitive life stages of listed species, I think there's nine of them, 12 months a year. Uh, an aquatic life within this narrow reach is subject to multiple stressors, including toxicity, excessive temperature, short distance upstream of the outfall or municipal water intakes, plus the outfalls of um, CSD Sacramento combined facilities. I mean, actually, these two sewer systems uh, comprise approximately 63% of the authorized municipal NPDES discharge in the entire Central Valley, or 86% authorized for the Delta. Uh, downstream are a number of agricultural intakes plus the three intakes for the proposed BDCP diversion, if it's ever approved. Uh, any permit for a discharge to this sensitive reach must be rigorous. And while we appreciate that the pro proposed order requires, you know, ammonia limits and denitrification, treatment to tertiary standards, something we've urged over the last uh, several permit iterations, uh, and we acknowledge that the ammonia limits will provide significant far field protection for lower tropic levels of uh, aquatic life. But unfortunately, the permit is deficient in protecting near field aquatic life, especially listed species within this sensitive reach. Staff now has, has ignored most of the 20 odd issues we raised in our appeal and presented at the July workshop. Uh, you know, uh, Richard McHenry and I have prepared those comments. So I've commented on NPDES permits before this board for some 20 years. Richard was uh, the senior supervisor in charge of issuing NPDES permits in the Sacramento Valley under four different regional board executive officers and concluded his career as the uh, chief engineer in this board's enforcement unit. I think they were reasonable comments. 
We quoted chapter and verse of the federal regulations and the state implementation plan for the CTR, and we stated that we believe that the proposed order violates the explicit and fundamental requirements contained in the SIP and the Code of Federal Regulations for issuing NPDES permits. It's been 24 months since we filed our appeal. The board requested and granted its own motion for review, quote, in order to have sufficient time to adequately review the voluminous submissions and allow a detailed legal and technical review of the submissions, end quote. <clears throat> However, at the July award workshop, board legal staff admitted that they had not reviewed C CSPA's issues. Board member Felicia Marcus stated that she'd like to see a response to our comments. We still have not seen a response. And as I said at that workshop, we'd like to understand your interpretation of the regulations on these issues. If we're wrong, tell us. If we're correct, help us understand the reasoning behind your reluctance to apply them. We understand regulations can be imperfect. There's a legal process to revise and improve promulgated regulations, but there is no legal reason to continue to ignore them. Regulations are not simply something to store on a shelf, to use or ignore as convenient. I mean, as Paul, you know, as Paul Simon just put it, I don't know how you issue a, a, a water a final, I mean, a water, an interim f water quality based limit. You issue a final limit with interim performance standards. I mean, it's, what is particularly puzzling is that at least on two previous occasions, the State Board agreed with us and remanded Davis and Yuba City permits before, before, because they failed to properly use ambient hardness in developing limits for hardness dependent models. I mean, metals. Even on issues you pre previously decided, your staff says it's not a significant issue and our concerns are thereby deemed denied. I mean, you know, we certainly believe that the discharge of metals exceeding properly developed aquatic life criteria into a water body impaired by toxicity are to failing cons to, con to, to consider the additive and synergistic interactions between these metals as required by the basin plan, you know, is a significant issue. We believe that continuing to ignore the thermal plan, and I noticed that the state contractor certainly joined with us on the comments on, on the thermal plan exception, but are they using the drinking water MCL in lieu of aquatic life criteria for aluminum, or circumventing mixing zone, or anti-backsliding, or anti-degradation requirements are significant issues. I mean, <laughs> even the failure to address our anti-degradation arguments is interesting considering the recent 6 November 3rd appellate district court ruling on the regional board's general order regulating milk cow dairies because that published order speaks specifically to the to issues we raised in our, our appeal on anti-degradation. So, but I do want to respond to one issue that we raised that staff did respond to. We submitted a comment based on the fact that the late revisions were made to the permit, which was not circulated for public review, and staff correctly points out that CP CSPA incorrectly cites 40 CFR 124.14, which is applicable only to permits adopted by the U.S. EPA. Of course, the State Board staff fails to note that we correctly cited two other sections of 40 CFR 124.6E and 124.10, which are applicable to state programs regarding the requirements for public notice and issuance of draft NPDES permits. And 40 CFR 124.10 requires notification that a draft permit has been prepared and that at least 30 days are allowed for public comment. And the section E requires that the fact sheet or the statement of basis, basis be transmitted to the public. Now here the regional board made significant modifications to the permit following issuance of the proposed permit for public comment that resulted in significant changes to the fact sheet or the statement of basis. And these late changes and the subsequent changes to the fact sheet were not transmitted to the general public for comment even though the changes were substantial. The late permit revisions were only made available to us the day of the regional board hearing. I mean, just prior to the hearing. We could not reasonably have fulfilled their requirement under 40 CFR 124.13 to raise all reasonable ascertainable issues and submit all reasonable available arguments supporting our position. I mean, and CSPA is contrary to staff's 
suggestion, we are harmed by the failure to allow significant time to comply with the requirements of 40 CFR 124.13. While staff correctly cites that 40 CFR 124.14 is not applicable to state programs, the section does set forth that 30 days is a reasonable time a period of time for the public to review and prepare comments on issues which may be legally and technically complex. And so I guess that, um, uh, I guess that's all. I'm, I'm just very, very disappointed that um, uh, we raised issues, uh, some of which have been addressed in previous permits and remanded to the board that some somehow are not no longer relevant. Uh, other issues that we had asked for some, some response, uh, whether we're right or wrong, but I think we're right. I think we accurately quoted the law. Uh, and I think that if we're a nation of laws and regulations, then we can't just use them when convenient. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any questions of staff on bills? We're saving them up. Thank you. Debbie Webster, before you fall asleep, Debbie. I saw you doze in there. I'm not dozing, and I'm even going to be here longer. Thank you. I'm Debbie Webster, the Executive Officer of the Central Valley Clean Water Agency Association. Excuse me. Now I can tell it's being late. Um, I wanted to uh, just speak of to this order and, and, and part of the reason why we're opposing it. And I think Paul Simmons really captured those issues. And in listening to uh, Bill's comments right now, you know, he said something, and I'm like, yeah, I'll, we agree with that. There's a legal process to revise and, or improve regulations. And this order, as it's revised, ignores Porter Cologne. It ignores the Water Code. It creates new regulatory authority, uh, creates new precedents. Um, you know, comes up with new terminology. I, one of the ones that gets me is, is the zone of reasonableness, things like that. It, it, it is of, of great concern to us and great concern on, on how it's going, you know, at, if it gets adopted, how it would be implemented, not only, you know, not only with the, just this permit, but with other permits in the Central Valley and throughout California. Um, and so uh, we are asking that you don't adopt this this order. We have specific comments that we put in writing, but but this is too important to try to do on a permit basis. The stuff that, that's the, the precedence that's being set in this order. So for that reason, we're asking that you don't adopt this order. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Paul Singarella. Good afternoon, Chair Hobbin, other members of, of the board. My name is Paul Singarella, here today representing the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and also speaking on behalf of the eight other water agencies. We've formed this, this block that you refer to as the water agencies. Uh, we serve water to 25 million people throughout California and uh, we provide irrigation water to several million acres of farmland in the state. We appreciate the work reflected in the revised draft water quality order before you today. It, the order and the permit uh, that it deals with uh, reflects years of work by the regional board and now by the state water board. There is an extensive, a robust administrative record, monstrous, if you will. Substantial analysis underlies this permit proceeding and this appeal. The discharger was included at virtually every step of the way. We urge you to adopt the water quality order today and doing so will be a critical step as the order itself recognizes towards restoring the Sacramento River and the Bay Delta and bringing the largest wastewater discharge in this region in line with modern standards for wastewater treatment. Now, in reading the discharger's papers, one gets the impression that the sanitation district is doing us all a favor by sending its excellent effluent, their term, not mine, to the Sacramento River. 
In reality, there is no right to discharge, and the permit before you was issued under the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, emphasis elimination. And no wastewater can be discharged into the Sacramento River or the Bay Delta without strict compliance with one of those permits, the NPDES. Another strong impression you may have gotten today, and also from the dischargers' papers, is that they are being singled out by some rogue ag agency for exceptionally conservative treatment. This is simply not true. There are a number of ways to illustrate how moderate the permit is. In the next few minutes, I want to give you four of uh, those examples. The first example, I'll call the similarly situated example. This permit, with regard to the effluent limits, does not stand alone. It's in good company. It's this sanitation district and its opposition to these limits that stands alone. There are literally several dozen publicly owned treatment works in the region that already are under permit requirements to treat nitrogen and also deal with pathogens through tertiary filtration. There is a wastewater plant back in Chesapeake Bay, an analogous estuary that's a national treasure that's been treating nitrogen since 1996. By the time this sanitation district gets there, it'll be literally about a quarter of a century behind the curve. The permit doesn't stand alone. The permit is within the bandwidth, to use your standard. It's similarly situated with other permits that this regional board has issued and that you have upheld in the past. The second point, I'll call it my apples and oranges points. It has to do with EPA's maximum tolerable risk level that they're urging you to follow. That risk level is 8 in 1,000, meaning that per EPA, a gross national risk level, uh, water can exert a maximum risk to swimmers of 8 people getting sick out of 1,000 swimmers. What they want you to do, and this is the apples and oranges, is they want you to engraft that risk level, which is from EPA guidance. They want you to engraft it onto two particular pathogens, and only those pathogens, Giardia and Cryptosporidium. They want to say that all of the allowable risk level that EPA is willing to tolerate for all pathogens in water, not just those two, should be assigned to those two particular pathogens in this instance. What they fail to recognize is that in this instance, those two protozoa and a risk assessment, a site-specific risk assessment that focused on them is what's driving the pathogen infiltration limits in this permit. What they fail to acknowledge is that their own risk assessor is the author of the assessment that said that the risks from those two protozoa are in excess of one in, in 10,000. What they fail to acknowledge is that the EPA guidance allows this site-specific approach. This is consistent with EPA. It's not inconsistent with EPA. EPA says, you know, if you want to look at specific pathogens, that's great. They call it quantitative microbial risk assessment, QMRA. And guess what you find in Dr. Gerber's February 2010 report? That very term. He says, I'm taking the off-ramp from just the approach based on indicator bacteria. I'm doing a QMRA. And on the basis of the QMRA that their expert prepared without any change to his numbers. The California Department of Public Health, as it does in this state, set a risk level of 1 in 10,000. And they simply don't like that risk level and want to grab